can read a lot into a face, not just about our emotions, but who we are and where we come from. Look in the mirror, and it's thousands of years of history that look back at you. Written into our facial features is a story going back countless generations. It's a story of migration and integration, of conquest and war. We look as we do because of our genes, genes that have been handed down through countless generations. Now, in an extraordinary study being carried out across Britain, genetic scientists are looking at our DNA to discover the truth about our ancient ancestors, who they were, where they came from, and what they looked like. And I'll be joining them on that epic journey back through time. I'll be meeting famous faces and ordinary people to find out how many of us are descended from ancient Celts, Anglo-Saxon farmers, Viking warriors, and Norman invaders. In a landmark research project, the first of its kind, scientists from Oxford University are collecting DNA samples from thousands of people across the country to establish exactly who our ancient ancestors were. It's a study that could rewrite the history of Britain. We know something of the ancient peoples who settled Britain, from the artifacts they left behind, from language and place names, but these can be misleading. Our genes, on the other hand, don't lie. Archaeologists like me are preoccupied with questions about our ancestors. Who were they? Where were they from? What were they like? And we try and answer the questions by looking at the things that our ancestors left behind. But that never gets us to the people themselves. And that's why the science of DNA is so fascinating to me, because I see it like another kind of archaeology. It's looking at something else our ancestors left behind, but that they left behind inside us. The man in charge of the project is one of the world's foremost geneticists, Sir Walter Bodmer. Genetics as a tool for looking at history has been around for some time, but the tools that we now have for looking at the DNA level, for looking really at the chemistry of the differences, are so much more powerful. They can tell us a lot more than was possible even 10 or 15 years ago. Sir Walter's team are taking blood from thousands of volunteers. From each sample, they extract DNA, which they compare with the DNA of other individuals in the same region, and with DNA taken elsewhere in Britain and abroad. What emerges is not only a genetic map of Britain, but also, in effect, a genetic history. Because from the patterns in the DNA, they hope to be able to tell which ancient people settled where and in what numbers. It's a kind of genetic doomsday book which promises to answer some of the questions that have puzzled historians for generations. So who are we hoping to find when we look into our DNA? The first permanent Britons were hunter-gatherers who, we think, came here from southern Europe when we were still connected by land, shortly after the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago. Their descendants were the flame-haired Celts, daubed in blue woad, who tried in vain to repel the Romans 2,000 years ago. The Angles and Saxon warriors from Denmark and Germany arrived in the 5th and 6th centuries. Then came the blue-eyed, blonde Viking raiders in their longboats from Scandinavia in the 9th and 10th centuries. And in the final great invasion of Britain came William the Conqueror's Norman army in 1066. Each of these peoples not only brought to Britain new customs, names and language, they also brought some fresh faces and new genes. Now, Face of Britain will reveal for the first time whether people in different parts of Britain are descended from the Celts, Anglo-Saxons or Vikings. In this film, we're going to start at the beginning by looking for DNA signs of the earliest inhabitants of Britain, the cave-dwelling hunter-gatherers and their Celtic descendants. I'll be looking at the archaeological record, some linguistic clues, and testing these against the new evidence from inside our DNA. And we're also going to see if we can still find the face of hunter-gatherer man on the streets of Britain today. Living as most of us do 
in cities and towns, it's hard to appreciate how empty prehistoric Britain was. So I've come to windswept Dartmoor to get a sense of what it might have looked like. Even today, Dartmoor is one of the least populated areas in the whole country. And on a day like this, it's not hard to understand why. 10,000 years ago, all of Britain was empty like this. There might have been no more than a couple of hundred people on this vast moorland. So with so few people to start with, how amazing would it be to find some of that original DNA within people alive today? The hunter-gatherers who first settled Britain developed over time into a farming people who we know as the Celts. Genetically, they're one and the same. And according to historians, these first Britons were probably driven westwards by successive waves of invaders. If historians are right, if there is such a thing as the Celtic fringe, then Sir Walter should be able to find genetic patterns which are common to people in the West Country but that differ from the rest of Britain. To find out, Sir Walter's team have come to Devon and Cornwall looking for volunteers to have deep roots in the area. We're hoping to get three and a half thousand people and they've all got to be sampled in the way we're doing it in rural areas, all four grandparents from the same area. So we can have that sort of deep look back in time which we need. Before the 19th and 20th centuries, most people lived in the country and they didn't move around very much. Therefore, if all your grandparents come from the same area, it's more likely that your origins are deeply rooted in that region. All my relatives basically came from North Devon and there hasn't been much movement in our sides of the family. All my family and my wife's family live in Beer. And in fact, we're related. My wife's grandmother and my grandfather were brother and sister. The earliest record I can find is 1321 at Tingmouth. They were ship owners and uh, importers. I felt I wanted to know where I'd actually come from. I would have thought pretty Celtic. Celt, definitely, yeah. The samples of DNA are packed and sent off to the labs in Oxford. It will take several weeks to analyse them. When the results come in, they should tell us for certain whether ancient DNA lives on in the population of the West Country today. In the meantime, I'm off to meet one of the Cornish volunteers, Ken Sweet. He's a perfect candidate. All four of his grandparents come from this area. Like others in the study, Ken's results are crucial in helping Sir Walter to establish how Celtic this region really is. Ken already knows that he's descended from a long line of Cornish tin miners and can trace his family tree right back to the early 1700s. So, you've been doing your homework? The family tree, the sweet family tree. This is the sweet side, yes. Look at how many people you've rounded up. How far back have you been able to trace your line? Well, I've gone back definitely to 1716, but individuals I have back to about 1530, and all within a six-mile radius of this point. Both Ken and his cousin Pauline share a common grandfather. Oh, fantastic. That gentleman, that gentleman is Elias. He's straight out of central casting, <laughs> surely. Right. He died at 68, but right. uh, his sons weren't so fortunate. He outlived five of his seven sons. Right. All the ones who went in mining died before the age of 40. Really? Yes, that was quite common. That was, uh, that was the norm. Given that your family stayed so local for so long, it, it must be tempting to think that your roots could go deeper still. I mean, there's every reason to think they might always have been from around here. I think that's very, very likely. It seems incredible. But could it be that Ken and his family are descended from the early hunter-gatherers who first settled in this area? Are we looking at the faces of Britain's very first inhabitants? Ken, he comes from a tin mining family, and tin mining in this area dates back to ancient times. Ken's cousin Brendan is restoring the tin mine which is in their back garden. What a dreadful way to spend your working life. Yes, it is. Yeah, working in these conditions all the time. Spending, damp the, and that. spending the best years of your life down a hole. That's right. And there's a vertical shaft. Yes, with the tin ore still, some of it left. 
so that's side. that's where they have to chase the the metal that they're after, yes. whatever direction it runs in the rock. That's right. Just imagine though, this is the kind of place that your grandfathers and great grandfathers and yeah. however far yeah. back they spent their lives in places like this. Not a very nice life, was it? Really? It's pretty humbling, really, that this is how they had to. This is how they had to live, mm. so that yeah. you could be. Yes, right. Ken's been able to trace his roots right back to the 1700s, but tin mining was already well established in Cornwall by then. I'm wondering if his tin mining ancestry might take him all the way back to prehistoric times. Archaeologists have found evidence that tin mining began here in Cornwall no less than 4,000 years ago. That's a full 2,000 years even before the Romans arrived, let alone the Angles and Saxons. Here in Chysoster, a pre-Roman settlement, archaeologist Jackie Wood has been investigating just how lucrative tin mining was to those early Britons. I was going to call this a substantial dwelling, but it's far more than that, isn't it? It's massively built. I mean, Chysoster, this, this particular settlement, is actually famous for being sort of massive structures, you know, seriously substantial houses. We're definitely not looking at somewhere where people are scratching a living, are we? Certainly not. These people were very prosperous. The classical historians said that they smelted the tin to the size of knuckle bones, and they put them in wagons, and they went, took those wagons across the causeway up to St Michael's Mount, which they call the Island of Ictus. Great big ships would go on the other side of the island where the water was deep. Not only were they exporting to South Wales and Ireland, they were actually taking their tin all the way down to the Mediterranean. So this place was a real hub of international industry. It would industry. have been known about throughout the entire Roman world, yeah, as being the Tin Isles. They call them the Cassiderites, the Tin Isles. 2,000 years ago, Cornwall was the spaghetti junction of the Atlantic, and that island there was the hub around which a Europe-wide metal trading industry revolved. The trade in tin also involved a trade in ideas. Over the centuries, skills and beliefs spread from Celts living in mainland Europe. But that spread of Celtic culture didn't necessarily involve the spread of genes. Most historians don't believe there were any mass invasions of Britain during this period. The Celtic tin miners were directly descended from the first hunter-gatherers who settled here. While the Oxford team are analysing the results of the West Country DNA, I'm off to examine some other clues as to the ancient identity of this region. And the first is language. The Celts who once lived in Britain spoke a language historians called Brythonic. It was very different from English, and echoes of this ancient language exist today in Breton, Welsh and Cornish. The Cornish language is currently enjoying something of a revival. There are now thought to be 400 fluent speakers here. Local singer Julie Elwyn has found a loyal audience for her Cornish songs. Special, please. Does it feel different to sing in Cornish than in English? Yes, completely. I celebrate my Celticness, my Cornishness. So you do feel that it's not just the Cornish thing, you feel the Celtic thing as well? Oh, totally. Um, there are links between the Celts. For instance, Cornish, Breton and Welsh are very, very similar. They're interchangeable. There are words that are very interchangeable. So just for the fun of it, how do I ask for a pint of beer in Cornish? A pint is Pinta. Uh -huh. So Pinta. Pinta. Pinta Corif Marplek. Pint of beer, please. Pinta Corif Marplek. Yeah, Pinta Corif Gwir. Pinta Corif Gwir. That's a pint of real ale. Pinta Corif Gwir Marplek. Yeah, that's it. I feel a little bit Cornish. <laughs> Place names are another cultural clue to the ancient history of a region. There's an old Cornish rhyming couplet that goes. By Trey, Paul and Penn, you shall know all Cornish men. Trey is a homestead or a settlement. Paul is a pond or a lake or a well. Penn is a hill or a, a headland. And if you look at the map of Cornwall today, it's littered with those prefixes on place names and house names and town names. In fact, in Cornwall, there are over 1,200 trays alone. And from place names often come surnames. 
they are also very useful historical clues linking us with our far distant ancestors. Tory MP and novelist Anne Widdicombe has a surname that suggests her origins in Devon go way back. But is her name a reliable guide to her ancient ancestry? Soon she'll know for certain, because Anne is one of the volunteers taking part in the genetics study. I've always been told that the E is quite significant. If you think of Widdicombe in the Moor in Devon, it only has one D, but it has an E. Um, and it's said that if you've got an E in the middle of Widdicombe, you almost certainly come from Devon. What we do notice is that the spelling changed in 1789. What I can show you, which is very interesting about the Widdicombe name, in 1881, this was the distribution of people bearing the Widdicombe surname. And that is the following. Oh, they're all in the West Country. Now, everybody's within a, a sort of a day's bike ride from everybody else with Ooh. the same name. Or horse ride. If you had asked me what do I expect to find, I would have said to you they would largely be in the West Country, but not exclusively. Yeah. Well, that's pretty exclusive. It certainly that's is. That's amazing. How much detail, though, have you been able to, to bring to the picture? Oh, there have been some colourful individuals. Uh, I had ancestors who were on the poor law. I had ancestors who held uh, quite major civic positions. On my mother's side, ancestors who were very snobby indeed and claimed to have money. Uh, though what happened to it, we've never been quite certain. Uh, and there is a, a, a legend in the family, which may well be reality, that one of my ancestors was a Cornish wrecker. So there's criminality in the Wickham well, line? we've always hoped not, but... Uh, that would be decidedly murky if it were true, yes. Although Anne has been able to trace her family back to the 1740s, her surname suggests that her roots in Dartmoor go much deeper. But will Sir Walter Bodmer's genetic test find a link between Anne and the hunter-gatherers and Celts who first lived here, or is she an Anglo-Saxon intruder? I would expect to find it pretty Celtic. So you think there's something of Devon running in your veins? Well, I know there's something of Devon running in my veins. What I should look to you is to tell me how much. Anne and many others in Cornwall and Devon love the idea of having Celtic origins. But is their cherished Celtic identity anything more than a romantic fantasy? Only the DNA can tell us for sure. Back at the lab, Sir Walter's team are moving closer in their search for those telltale genes in the West Country. Here's how the science actually works. We've each inherited genetic characteristics from our parents, and these determine everything about us, the way we look, shape of face, length of nose, colour of hair. Each generation is connected one to another by biological threads passing through us, to our parents and grandparents, and all the way back to ancestors we didn't know we had. Sir Walter's team are looking at hundreds of genes in each sample of DNA. By analysing variations between these genes, the team can build up a distinct DNA picture of an individual and even a whole region. This can be compared with other regions, with similar DNA studies abroad, and with the historical records. The results should tell us how Celtic or Anglo-Saxon we really are. What's more, these differences should, in theory, be reflected in our faces. Facial features are fascinating. The basic shape of the face is very largely genetically determined. But unfortunately, we don't know very much about that yet. In other words, we don't know which particular genes are contributing to that. If we did, my guess is that those would be amongst the most informative markers to distinguish different populations. Dr Tony Little, a psychologist from Stirling University, is a specialist in facial recognition. He's working with digital photographs taken of the volunteers from the DNA survey. By using the latest technology, he's been able to analyse these photographs to produce, for the first time, typical regional faces of Britain. So this is an individual face from Cornwall, right. and we mark points on it. So we mark features uh, around the face. Once Tony has marked his individual faces, the facial recognition software calculates mathematically average faces of Cornwall, and Devon. So this is a face bearing the average features collected from all the Cornish faces. So, so whatever traits are typical of the, of the Cornish people, this face should embody those traits. OK. What's fascinating is that Tony's typical Cornish face is indeed different from facial types found in other regions of Britain. 
it certainly suggests a different ancient ancestry. But all that number crunching tends to iron out the character. So is there really a typical regional look in Cornwall? The locals I've spoken to are convinced there is. So I've got up at the crack of dawn on another glorious Cornish morning to come down to Newland Fish Market to meet a couple of local experts who are going to show me some local people. We're on quality month there, five kilos there, quality month there, who's going to start me up? I don't know, four kilos there, what are they worth? Fish merchant Robin Turner comes from a long line of Newland fishermen. He needs a keen eye for faces in his job. Photographer Simon Green has been snapping the locals for four years. Right, your mission today, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is to spot some classic Cornish Celtic men. Well, you're in the right place. What would you say is a Celtic face? How would you pick it out? I'd say rather a rugged look, uh, rather a dark character, and that doesn't mean, uh, how can I say, nasty, <laughs> but a rather dark and complexion character. Yeah, I think rugged's a, a really good word to use. Um, I think they tend to have quite defined, defined features. Uh, gen sort of generally prominent nose, prominent chin. We go into the market there, I'm sure. All right. Find okay. There you go, son. Oh, yes. <laughs> Robin yeah. tells me you of the classic Cornish face. Is that uh, fair to say? I suppose so, yeah, you could say that, yeah. Yeah, bent nose and that, yeah. yeah. Great, okay, right. slip this right. That's great. That's excellent. Thank you. Terry, I'll put some mackerel there for you. Never mind the mackerel, Robin. Where are my people? <laughs> <laughs> you recognise yourself as Cornish? Oh, yeah. You definitely. look in the mirror and it, yeah. it comes right back at yeah, you, doesn't it? Yeah. Definitely. Just look this way. That's lovely. You're very specific on this. Yeah, yeah. I must say, I'm starting to see a similarity between the people he's picking out. Really? Yeah, definitely. Celts. Celts. It just relax, that's great. That's great, that's excellent. Thank you. And you know what I'm going to say now, don't you? Yeah. I need your photo for the collection. <laughs> That'll be all right. <laughs> Certainly. Just try and keep a straight face. <laughs> try and keep a straight face. That's excellent. OK. With some good Cornish male faces on our memory chip, we're off in search of their female counterparts. I hope these Cornish women are swimmers. That's all I can say, Robin. Well, it's part of the characteristic that I'm looking for is to have the broader shoulder. Uh-huh. Uh, the slightly more athletic <laughs> build. You're saying that Cornish women are fit. I'm saying Cornish women are very fit. Well, I think, Stevie, you're a, you're a very uh, Cornish girl from Newland. Are we right? Well, I would say if you've got dark hair, dark eyes, then yes, that's Cornish. Uh, superb. We're on the lookout for fit, athletic, <laughs> amphibious women. Excuse, mm -hmm. excuse us, are you from a Cornish family? I am, yes. I'm from Pengelly, Spain. Um, Pengelly? Yeah. And is that, a, is that a classic Cornish Yeah, it's name? one of the tree poles and pens, what we call. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Okay, that's excellent. Well, Thanks very much. Cornish born and bred. It, it says in your band. But, um, blonde hair. You said that Cornish women were dark. I did, but I, I, I must be honest, it's all so pleasant to see the rosy character of a good blonde woman coming through here <laughs> who goes back generations into Cornish history, and your family does, I believe, being an Eddie. Indeed, yes. And is that a Cornish name, Eddie? Eddie is. It's not so well, but yes, you don't tend to see it um, much through the rest of the country. Keep smiling in the rain. <laughs> Thank That's you. great. Thank you very much. My pleasure. OK, then. You know things have got bad when the locals have come out wearing dry suits. Our face expert, Dr Tony Little, was then shown the faces picked out as typically Cornish by Robin and Simon. What's quite interesting about these faces is that they share a lot of common characteristics. They do look somewhat similar. I mean, to they, each they, other? They, they don't really look like brother and sister, but you can see certain traits that, that are consistent across the two. But if you look at, at our average Cornwall face, you can see again something in the jaw shape. So they both are composite face and Rodney. They both have these, these masculine jaw shapes. I think as well, if you look around the eyebrow region, they've got this, this quite dominant looking, very straight eyebrow set. So with a little science and a lot of help from the locals, we've established as far as we can the face of Cornwall. But how does this compare with the facial appearance of our ancient Celtic forebears? With the assistance of one of Britain's leading forensic experts, I'm going in search of the face of ancient Britain. 
The first inhabitants of Britain were hunter-gatherers who came here from southern Europe about 10,000 years ago. Historians believe their descendants, the Celts, were then driven westwards by successive waves of invaders. So if we're able to find any genetic signs of the first Britons, it should be in the DNA of people living in the western Celtic fringe of Britain. Soon, the results of the study will start to come through. But first, I'm off to see an old face from many years ago. You can tell a great deal about a person by looking at the face. And with modern scientific techniques, experts can recreate a face from the skull. And so hopefully, this will enable us to see if people living in the southwest today bear any physical similarity to their ancient ancestors. We need an ancient Celtic face to compare with our modern Cornish faces. And to get it, I'm turning to one of the top facial reconstruction experts in the country, Dr Caroline Wilkinson at Dundee University. Caroline has helped to solve some of the most complex forensic cases. One of them involved this burial site in Bleed in Somerset, where in 1999, archaeologists discovered the skeleton of an ancient Celt. Using the latest forensic techniques, Caroline has been able to recreate his face. How do you arrive at that final face? Well, obviously we start with the skull and we, we work on a plaster copy of the skull. And the methodology is really based on anatomy. So we model the, the muscles of the face one by one onto the skull. To me, the features look very strong. There's quite a pronounced brow, there's a, a big nose. I would even call that a Roman nose because of the kind of bump to it. There's a cleft chin. Do you get all of that from the bones of the skull? In particular with bleeding man, you can see that he has quite large nasal bones and quite projecting, which would suggest quite a large projecting nose. Um, he has quite a strong brow, which is common of a, of a middle-aged man. Right. Uh, it's quite a big skull, quite a robust, but um, quite thin lips as well. Is there any way of knowing if this fella is typical of someone from 3,000 years ago in the West Country? We can't make any generalisations from just one face, but it's certainly not atypical of faces from that area. And certainly his skull is similar to a lot of other skulls from 3,000 years ago from Europe. Um, there are a number of characteristics that are common, such as this rounded, what's called brachycephalic shape to the cranium, and the quite wide, square jaw that you often get. Caroline's research suggests that the ancient Celts had a rounder face and squarer jawline than Anglo-Saxon skulls found in eastern England. But how does this tally with what expert Tony Little found in the faces of our volunteers? I think it's interesting. Well, everyone is an individual, so their yeah. faces do differ. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, I, mean, I think there are some similarities you can pick up from these images in terms of the shape of the jaw and uh, the shape of the eyes as well. But what's really fascinating is that when Tony took comparative measurements of the faces and cross-referenced them with examples across Britain, he found the Cornish face to be the closest match of all. For Tony, jaw shape and eye size were the key factors. There seems to be something about the Cornish face that's somewhat closer to the ancient British face than some of the other groups we've been looking at. The facial similarities here are compelling. Could it mean that many people living in Cornwall and Devon today are directly descended from the Celts and before them, the hunter-gatherers who first settled Britain? Sir Walter Bodmer's epic survey of the DNA of Britain is starting to yield results. And after several weeks of analysis, his team believe they have made a breakthrough. The results are resoundingly solid and quite remarkable. The team have indeed found key genetic differences between people in the West Country and other areas of Britain. They found differences in the frequency of various blood types here, also in the set of five HLA genes used by doctors for tissue matching. And finally, they found differences in one of the most visible of genetic markers, which they call MC1R, but is otherwise known as the ginger gene. It's one of the sets of genetic differences we look at, we call it MC1R. And there are variants of that, where if you have the variants together, you tend to have red hair. Red hair is perhaps one of the most famous characteristics associated 
with the Celts. We have found that the frequency of those variants is higher in Devon and Cornwall than in other parts of the county. And we are seeing fascinating differences between the people of Devon and Cornwall as representing that Celtic population that came across after the Ice Age. I think we've really got to put Devon and Cornwall together and say they represent the Celtic fringe in that part of England. That ancient blood from those people that came 10,000 years ago or more is still running in living veins. I just find that astonishing. Well, of course, it's not their blood, it's that DNA sequence. So Sir Walter has shown a definite link between the population of the West Country and the first people who settled in Britain about 10,000 years ago. So the fact that many of our West Country faces bear more than a passing resemblance to the ancient Celt may be no accident. But how far does the DNA of individuals within the study conform to the distinctive regional pattern? The answer will effectively tell them how pure their Celtic origins are and whether or not their individual bloodline has been sullied by Anglo-Saxon or some other DNA. Anne Widdicombe has been able to trace her Devonian and Cornish roots back to the 1700s. But is she a pure-blooded Celt? Hello, Walter. Nice to hear from you. Yes, it's uh, nice to be able to talk to you, and, and thanks so much for taking part in, a, in our study. No, yeah, it's been a great pleasure, great fun as well. Uh, I think you may know we're, what we're doing is with the small sample that we got from you. We're able to look at quite a lot of genetic markers. Uh, your results sit very much in the middle. You're somewhat more Celtic than oh. Anglo-Saxon, but not by a huge amount. Having studied the combination of genetic markers in Anne's DNA, Sir Walter has found that she's 1.2 times more strongly Celt than Anglo-Saxon. So despite the fact that her name and family roots are deeply planted in the Celtic West Country, there's a significant chunk of Anglo-Saxon in there too. So I, I hope you're not too unhappy with your results. And, uh, I'm not at all unhappy. I'm very proud either to be a Celt or an Anglo-Saxon, but I would have been surprised if the, uh, if the predominance hadn't been Celtic. Cornishman Ken Sweet has travelled to Oxford for his results. Well, I'm delighted you could take part in our study. It's very, very nice yes. to meet you. Ken has traced his tin mining ancestors back to the 18th century, but is dearly hoping that his roots in Cornwall go back into prehistory. This is the moment of truth. So we've taken all these results and we've said, how much more likely are you to be from the Celtic origin, which, which we think of as related back to the original people that came across from uh, the south of Europe. And so what we end up with is saying that you're about two times as likely to be of that sort of Celtic origin than Anglo-Saxon. So does that mean that Ken has a line that goes back, to some extent, to those original people that crossed from the continent? Yes, the original people that came across uh, from further south after the Ice Age. After all this time, you can still find traces of blood that came to these islands 10,000 years ago. It just surprises me that it hasn't all just become a homogenous mix. It's a whole new chapter in my life story, isn't it? In my family's story. And I do think that uh, it's really important to know as far as you can about your roots, because it, it's who you are. So the archeological and linguistic evidence have been confirmed by the DNA. Very good news for those Devonians and Cornish who proudly boast about their ancient Celtic heritage. This Celtic cultural identity, of course, runs strong in other areas too, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Southwest Wales will be my next stop, following Sir Walter's team as they take DNA samples in Pembrokeshire. The Welsh have been known to zealously proclaim their Celtic identity. The trouble with the Wales for the Welsh idea is there have been many visitors to Pembrokeshire over the centuries. The original Celtic inhabitants were plagued by marauding Viking raiders from the 9th century onwards. We know that William the Conqueror sent Norman lords here to keep the locals in line. And just for good measure, Flemish traders settled here in the 12th century. In fact, with everyone marching through, it's been more or less like Piccadilly Circus. So are the Welsh of today mistaken if they imagine themselves as pure-blooded Celts? While Sir Walter's team gathers the DNA, let's have a quick look at the cultural evidence. 
This is Pentrefan, a 5,500-year-old burial chamber and the most famous monument of its kind in Wales. You find others just like it in Cornwall and even as far away as Brittany. Pentrefan suggests there were common customs and cultures between these areas. It's also thought that 5,000 years ago, there may have been a common tongue, the ancient Brythonic language. If that were true, then Welsh and Cornish share a common linguistic ancestor. To find out, I've devised a cunning experiment to see if a thirsty Cornish speaker makes any sense to a Welsh-speaking barman. Hello. Pinta Corif Gwea, Mark Lech. Pinta Gorozink. Please. What was that I said? You said, can I have a pint of Coro Tavern Sink? And that made sense to you, though I was speaking Cornish. Yes, it did. It was very, very similar to what we'd have asked if it was in Welsh. Amazing. What would the Welsh have been? If it can I have a pint of Coro. <laughs> that is the beginning and end of my Cornish. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's amazing. See, it's the universal language of pubs, I suppose, but still, the barman here wanted a pint of beer. It's great. But language and customs are not necessarily a reliable indication of ancestry. Language can be learned. Laws and culture can be imposed on people. Your genes, on the other hand, tell the real story. Sir Walter's team are now collecting DNA samples in Pembrokeshire. With such strong cultural links to Devon and Cornwall, Will he find Celtic genes to match? Non Harris is one of the volunteers. She's perfect for the study. All four of her grandparents came from Deanus Cross in North Pembrokeshire, and she's passionate about her Welsh heritage. She's been able to trace her seafaring ancestors right back to the 18th century. Well, I know I come from a seafaring family. My great-great-great-grandfather um, was born in the village and he was a sea captain. His sons were all sea captains, their sons were sea captains. That might be a good sign that your family does go all the way back because seafaring is ancient here. But one of the seafarers in Non's family may point to a very different lineage. There is a story that, um, that I found in, in a newspaper that I am uh, a direct descendant of Simon Harry the Viking. <laughs> Simon the Viking. Simon the Viking. How much is that of a Norse name? I don't know. But uh, there's a, a piece in a paper that was written in 1908, I think. Here we are. A great buccaneer named Harry, together with his confederates, landed in Aberbach, mm -hmm. which is a beach in the village. He came over, it seems, from Ireland, but he was originally a Norseman from Scandinavia. He settled on Dinas Moor at a place known since as Tyros, which we owned, which is just across the road. I mean... <laughs> so, so for all your Welshness and your pride in that... Yeah. It sounds as if you're talking there about being descended from possibly the ultimate seafarers. Well, the Vikings, the Vikings, yeah. What would you do if Simon the Viking is a fake and he's actually an anglo saxon Oh, no! Don't say that. I can't be Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> no, no. It might have been a Walter Mitty character. No! I don't, I don't want to know about that. <laughs> no, I hope I'm, I am Welsh and Welsh through, through time. A Viking genetic legacy is not as far-fetched as it sounds. Hordes of Viking raiders descended on Pembrokeshire from the middle of the 9th century onwards. But it was the Normans who came here in the 11th century who had the greatest physical impact on the area. The castles here are a forceful reminder of their dominance. But did the Normans come here in great numbers? And did they mix? Curiously, there is today a part of South Pembrokeshire which is known as Little England Beyond Wales. This tiny island of Englishness is so strictly delineated, it suggests that the Normans and Celts most certainly did not mix. The border can still be located today. It's called the Lansker Line. It starts, for the sake of argument, at Newgale Bridge, which is the bridge down there, just at the end of the beach. And then it runs across country and down in the general direction of Haverford West. Everything north of the line on the map is noticeably Welsh. It's Welsh place names, Welsh farm names, Clandaloy, Trey Griffith. You come south of the line and it's very marked the way the place names become English again. You've got Duckhole Wood, 
Summerhill Mill. That is the break between Wales and Little England beyond Wales. But can we find a genetic difference between North and South Pembrokeshire, either side of the Lansker line? Only the DNA results will tell us. Local historian David Hughes has deep roots in South Pembrokeshire and is another of our DNA volunteers. This is the first time I've met David, and I must say he looks remarkably like a Cornish Celt to me. But he believes his ancient origins lie elsewhere. Ah, well, of course, the Normans, they came and they built their castles. And then around the 12th, 13th century, uh, Henry I offered the lands of Pembrokeshire to the Flemish. Their lands in Flanders were flooded. The king wanted to subdue what was left of the rebellious Welsh, so overcame the Flemish. And although they were workers and weavers, they did stamp their authority uh, in Pembrokeshire. What do you think the genetic study might reveal about you? I don't know, really. Uh, we were always brought up to believe uh, that this side, where we are now, we were Flemish, uh, Norman, Welsh, and possibly a little bit of Nordic, because the Norse came a long time ago. And how would you feel if it revealed a strong Celtic bloodline? I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted. When you look around at the architecture, the Norman castles and churches, it's easy to see the cultural imprint of the invaders, but did they also leave their mark on the blood of the inhabitants? Is South West Wales about to be booted out of the Celtic fringe? The Welsh are desperately proud of their Celtic heritage. The trouble is, Vikings, Normans and Flemish also came here at various times. Do the locals here really have pure-blooded Celtic ancestry? Only their DNA can provide the answer. Alongside Sir Walter's DNA testing, we've also taken photographs of volunteers at the Welsh Bleed and given them to our face expert, Dr Tony Little. From these, he's able to create a composite face, which is typical of this sample group. The results are quite extraordinary. The mathematical composite image created by combining all our Welsh faces shows some subtle differences from the Celtic face we found in the West Country. But the likeness is obvious and striking. The facial evidence seems to point to a strong genetic link between the West Country and South West Wales. But only the DNA analysis can say for sure. For South West Wales, Sir Walter Bodmer has been able to compare the DNA results of his own study with an existing survey of blood group types in Pembrokeshire. To the relief of all those Welsh Druid recreation societies, the team has found no significant difference from the Celtic DNA found in the West Country. The results reveal the Welsh here are indeed descended from the ancient Celts. Well, Pembrokeshire broadly looks like Devon and Cornwall fits in with Wales being part of the Celtic fringe. But remarkably, where there is discernible difference is in South Pembrokeshire, or Little England beyond Wales. Here, there is clear genetic evidence of Flemish ancestry. There is that fascinating story about Little England beyond Wales. And that is also reflected in the genes. Now, there was an earlier study that just used the ABO blood types because the results show that the frequency of blood type A was just really higher there than it was in other parts of Wales. And that's what one would expect from those Flemish settlers. So I think that's a remarkable example of how the genetics can go together so well with the history. Non Harris is very proud of her Welsh identity and would be pretty disappointed to find some Anglo-Saxon lurking around her DNA strands. It's time for her results. Well, in, in our simple calculations, you're at least one and, of the order of one and a half times more likely to be Celtic than Anglo-Saxon. Yes! <laughs> so perhaps her mysterious ancestor, Simon Harry the Viking, was just a fantasy after all. It's a terrible uh, relief, Walter, because oh, I think it might have gone badly for us if you'd told no one anything else. I'd have been walking through the door. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the surprise result is David Hughes, not a Welsh speaker, he hails from the other side of the Lansker line, Little England beyond Wales. This area still has a strong Flemish inheritance, but according to Sir Walter, 
David's blood type excludes him from the Flemish contingent. What's more, he has the telltale Celtic characteristic, two variants of the MC1R marker, the ginger gene. All this means that David is a whopping 5.3 times more likely to be Celtic than Anglo-Saxon. In this programme, I've been trying to disentangle the ancient roots of the people who live in southwest Britain. I've met individuals who have very different ideas about what their Celtic past means to them. But what the DNA proves is that they're descended from the very first hunter-gatherers who started to populate Britain 10,000 years ago. In the rest of this series, I'll be following Sir Walter's progress across other parts of Britain as he compiles his genetic doomsday book of the British people. Next stop, the east coast of England, to find out whether people there really are descended from the Anglo-Saxons, those Germanic invaders who settled in the 6th century. To get there, I must cross Offa's Dyke, the ancient mud wall built by an Anglo-Saxon king, Offa, in the 8th century, to keep the unruly Welsh Celts at bay. Offa's Dyke is the perfect symbol of the divide between the world of the Welsh and the world of the English. But when it comes to the genetic map of Great Britain, will we find as clear a border? Celtic blood on this side and Anglo-Saxon blood over there.